Welcome to episode five of Beyond the Big Sky. We are talking about elk calling. And I tell you what, I'm excited about this. Elk season is right around the corner, and you know for me, I love calling in elk, and I know you do too. I know a lot of people have been wanting to hear this episode, but if you have any other ideas that you want to hear about, like, comment, message us, tell us what you think. If you have something you want to hear about, to feel free to tell us i tell you it's been exciting all the comments we've been getting all the way from georgia to indiana california that people are listening and we appreciate it and all around the world so let's get into elk calling everybody i mean let's get a little bit of some things you've accomplished with elk calling you know i've been really fortunate um I w- i've won many state competitions I won the Eastern United States uh, elk calling competitions hosted by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Um, Then I won the world elk calling competition in the pro division. Um, And so I've had a lot of success with that. I've uh, hosted and emceed several calling competitions. I started the best of the West elk elk calling competitions. Uh, Your mom and I, Marcia, um, also uh, currently host uh, the elk calling competitions at the Western Elk Hunting and Conservation Expo in Salt Lake City, Utah, every February, which that's fun. And uh, it's it's besides that, calling elk in uh, f- since I was 16 years old and guiding since I was 21. But I'm not the only one that's had some uh, elk calling success. How about you? You know, when I was a kid, yeah, I competed at the rocky mountain Oak foundation thing and i won second in the world in the peewee when i was what 10 <laughs> yeah nine or 10 yep so and well the reason we were a week late on a podcast is where were you at <laughs> well marsh and i were actually at the rocky mountain elk foundation world elk calling championships in park city utah great event and uh, we were two of the judges they have seven judges there and it was our honor to to be a judge and uh, we, we each judged and uh, crowned the, the New World uh, champions, and it was so great. There, were, there was over 60 competitors at that event and just a lot of great calling. And your name was even on the old trophy, wasn't it? <laughs> it sure was. That, was. that was neat to see there. It was uh, to have your name on that World that Championship trophy. 97 or when did you 1997, that? yep. Way before me. <laughs> Not too far before me. Way about four years maybe <laughs> so why don't we talk start out with like the basics of the person that's just learning how to elk call maybe they drew a tag in montana colorado and they want to know the basics for just trying to learn okay why don't we start off on that and then we can dive a little deeper into it well we're going to talk mostly today about diaphragm elk calls or the reed calls that go in the roof of your mouth i like these calls because your hands free you can have a bow in your hand, a muzzleloader in your hand, a rifle, and your hands free. Some of the other calls, if you're biting down on them or, or different things, they can get in the way of your shots, especially for bow hunting. So I like the hands free. And I think too, the diaphragm, the percentage of people that just use like the hoochie mom or the squeeze calls or the bite down, is that not, I mean, you can hear it a mile away that it's what that sounds like you know it is and those are all good calls and uh will primos for years and they they designed that and i'll tell you one of the things i've learned with those calls is you you put them in your pocket and you you can play with them a little bit so they're a little more muffled a little more realistic sounding um but you're right the the mouth calls give you the most variety and the most realism uh out there and uh, it's just all around. Now, the call I like to use the most is a double read. I can do my cow calls. I can do my bull sounds. Um, if you want, Wyatt, we can go a variety and show all the different sounds you can make. Let's just, just go through that. that. If you've been to any of Dad's seminars, you've heard him go through all the noises you can make with the diaphragm. So, I mean, the people that haven't, let's just go through that. All right. So, we're going to start out with a cow call. And we'll teach you how to make those sounds as the podcast goes on. We can do a bull elk. How about a turkey? Now, I know you like making those sounds. Uh, How old were you when you took your first turkey grand slam? Oh, what was I? Ten. 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 I finished my grand slam. 
Got all four subspecies of turkeys. That was pretty, that was really fun. That was fun. I still remember <laughs> the excitement of you out there. And we finished that one off uh, down in Florida with a good friend Jeff down there. And man, that was that was so awesome. What else can we do? We can do a coyote call, a howl. call your wife in with this call or girlfriend <coughs> very versatile you can do a squirrel what else we can do a loon? I, I, you might have heard this sound when you're driving to town the other day <coughs> i didn't hear this this time i know sometimes i may have but uh if you're going a little too fast you might hear this It might be mom more than you. No. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, I think I've probably been pulled over more than mom has, <laughs> just saying. But uh, anyway, you can do a, a siren over in England. <coughs> do a loon with it. And of course, the dog with his tail caught in the door. That's a classic. That's a classic. So those are all the sounds I just made with that double reed um, call. It fits right in the roof of your mouth. Um, and, and that's it's a very versatile call. Now, you can call too. And uh, we might talk about a little buddy calling and so forth as we get into it and i'll say if anybody is listening to this and not on the youtube if you want to see more of a hands-on demonstration go and watch the youtube video so you can see how we use the calls and it's a little bit i mean i always think it's easier to watch something to learn than just listening so feel free that will be uploaded on youtube as well absolutely so what one of the most common calls we use when we're hunting is what cow elk cow elk it's, it's all the time and I, it's no different than when you're doing a hen yelp for turkeys and it's during the rut the bulls are looking to gather their cows or, or keep them in a herd and so a cow call is one of the easiest calls you can make now to make this sound what do you do put it in your mouth and you go nia with your nia. tongue on the top so you put it right in the roof of your mouth the tongue goes up against the latex. I always put a little bend in mine. I put the short reed down on a double reed. Yeah. And for people not knowing how to ever use this, it goes right in the roof of your mouth, and then your tongue pushes the latex as you blow out. That's right. And the dental tape around the, the back side of it, that goes towards the back. Now, one of the questions we get all the time when we're doing seminars is, how young should young people start why it started when he was probably three or four years old um but you want to make sure this fits their mouth you want to make sure they don't choke so uh that's very important you know children i'm not saying oh go put them in little little uh, child's mouth but when you have kids that are growing up like you guys did right right alongside us colin we would take a, a piece of dental floss and a needle and we'd string that through the edge and leave about two feet out so you could pull it out and, real easy. And something else you did is you take scissors and take and trim just a little bit out. Because, I mean, that's for an adult's mouth. Yep. So you got to think the, the plate in the top of a kid's mouth is smaller. So if you just trim a little bit of that, it makes a big difference too. It, it does because you want that air to seal. Mm -hmm. So the air goes between your tongue and it goes in between that, that latex Seated. to give you the sound. I'll tell you why. It was really cool this year. I was in Park City, Utah, and I was talking to a, uh, a man who had won the World Men's Open division last year. And he came up to me and said, hey, you remember 20 plus years ago in Portland, Oregon? He said, you were doing an elk seminar. And he said, I was gagging on the call. I couldn't use the call. I was having the hardest time. And you told me that trick about the dental floss. So it, it's not just for kids. It's for adults. And uh, this year, he placed uh, in the pro division, I think the top five in the world. And he won, he might have been second this year, and he won the men's division last year. So uh, so cool to see people like that. It is. It's just such an encouragement to see people, and, and it's just fun. So let's talk about it. You said Nia. I want you to give me an example of it. 
And so that's that's a very, very basic call. And one of the things Wyatt and I will do and Walker is we'll set up and we'll have that collar behind us 30 to 50 yards so that elk will focus on that. I know you did that with a buddy of yours a few years ago. You know, that works really good, and especially something that we found like early or late season when they're either before the ruts really started or after, sometimes – if there's an elk hanging up and he's just sitting on the side of a hill, what I did is I'll sit down there in the bottom and just keep calling. And I mean, they don't, they're at the point where they're not coming in, but mm-hmm. they're still curious enough. They're going to hang around. Right. So, I mean, sometimes that's enough to keep them distracted just to stay right there. And then someone can slip in, slip in on them when they're watching you. Then you had that happen. It worked. Yep. That's good. So again, for a cow call, it's a knee. <coughs> a calf call, which is a younger um, elk and it'll answer that cow you do what higher tongue pressure and higher airflow yeah. so do you want to do a calf call <coughs> so an example of Wyatt and I calling back and forth say we may be 30 yards apart and we're both hunting and we're trying to get that bull to commit it will sound like this That's very realistic. Now, if you want an estrus call or a cow looking for a bull um, as, as she's an estrus, you draw that call out a little longer. And I'll use a little bit of my voice I'm going while I'm making that sound. So let's jump into bull calls. Oh, that's my favorite. And let's talk about like your grunt too, but some of these people just learn and they might not even know what that is you know that's a good point Wyatt. so for those watching on uh youtube this is a grunt tube um this is one i like for indoors and competition works good hunting also um when i'm hunting a lot of times i carry a small one uh i'll put them in the pocket of my pants just because i don't want anything to get in the way of my bowstring if i draw back last thing you want is it to get in your way so uh, keep that in mind why do we use this? Well, a couple different reasons you use a grunt tube, and this is what it looks like. It looks like a small wiffle ball bat. You can direct the sound a direction you want to go. So you can use your hand, but if you're trying to sound like you're farther away for that bull to be looking past you, coming toward you, you call behind you, and that's going to make a better sound. So that's another piece of equipment. And also, we make those too. Like, and if you- if you're just getting started you can go to the dollar store or walmart and buy a just a cheap kid's wiffle ball bat and cut the ends out that's what i use yeah you do and they're Um, light too (laughs) yeah you spray paint them so that they're more of a camouflage because most of those are orange or yellow or green or or whatever but you have that so getting into the bull sounds and there are a lot of varieties of bull sounds you can make but we're going to show you the some realistic ways first off we're going to talk about the bugle. Now, to make those first sounds, why you go ahead and start with the bugle. Start with the gur and then increase tongue pressure. <laughs> so that's your bugle. You start gur, increase your airflow, tongue pressure, and it went up. Now, you want to sound equal to or smaller than the bull you're, you're calling in. So you can get real raspy. You can use your voice, which we do. When we say grr, we're going, Arr! now, if you want to sound like a big herd bull, and I don't recommend that Sometimes very it scares often. them off more than anything. It does. Even the big bulls, they think it's competition. They right. don't even want to mess with they it. They do. But you can get down there and go, You don't, you don't want to do that. I always say equal to or smaller than. One of the bugle sounds I do a lot and have a lot of success is a high to low sound. And it sounds like this. It's, it's very simple. The other thing I think is very important is we're laying the groundwork down. Why it is don't call too long. An average bull will call how long? I mean, a couple of seconds. A couple of seconds. Three to five is average bull. I have timed a bunch of them in the woods. I have played back video and over and over. 
they don't call as long as A lot of them just grunt. or just, I mean, if you hear an old bull, by the end of the rut, he's all he's doing is going to squeal and a little chuck like that. It's called calling out. Now, the, the way to explain this, and we're throwing a lot of information at you real quick, is say you go to a football game, basketball game, and you've been yelling and screaming and cheering that team on, and all of a sudden you get really hoarse. That's what the bulls sound like. Here's an example of a called-out bull, what he might sound like. He can chuckle, but he can't do that. So let's talk about the chuckles and everything else. We started with the bugle. Grrr, three to five tones. When you hit that last tone, you go, let that air out. Just like a bowl going, and, yeah. and then the grunt. So important. It's an exhale inhale and i think a lot of people just exhale like when they're just learning they just go and just blow out and it sounds not even close it's very mechanical sounding go ahead and let's hear that do a bugle with an x exhale only (laughs) yeah it's choppy and fast when i was judging the world i was sitting back there and i'd write notes choppy call whatever you want to be realistic so to get that realistic sound i say (gasps) chuh And I, don't swallow. I inhale. Don't <laughs> swallow the call there. You're right. But when I inhale, I'm still making a little bit of sound with that call, but it's just free floating in my mouth. So it'll go. <laughs> so it ch- and I'm, I'm inhaling. A lot of that Pick inhale up. is my voice. So those are all good, good sounds to make. So let's put it all together. Why you do a bugle? I'll do a bugle. Now, one of the things I think is important for people that are listening to this podcast to realize is some of the worst elk callers in the world are elk. It's true. Some of the worst elk callers in the world are elk. I've heard some horrible sounds. I remember being up in the Little Belts one time in Montana, and I'm like, oh, that's got to be a hunter. That's horrible. This sounded terrible. And it was an elk. (laughs) So I tell you, treat every bugle. Always be careful and safe, but treat every bugle as as a bull out there and practice, practice, practice. This is a skill like we tell people at the Pagara Shooting Academy. It's a perishable skill, your shooting skills. Well, so is elk calling. Right now, August is coming up right now, the first part of August, and you should be practicing. Most seasons start the first part of September. So we've went over the bugle. We've went over the grunt. Let's talk about that squeal sound, that buzz bugle they call it. I think that's a hard thing that a lot of people can't do. It is. And how you make that is you do a high tone, and you take your lips, and what do you do? (laughs) So, take this call, go. That sound is so realistic and will work very, very well on elk, because, especially you're hunting in a public land area and there's hunters that are sounding like this. And that doesn't then, sound very realistic. It doesn't, but you'll hear that a lot. And we're not doing this to make fun of people. We're doing this to try and help them sound more realistic. You hear that call, and then you hear this sound. <laughs> You're going to go. Sounds a lot more like an elk. Hmm, and that bull. I tell you, some of those public land areas, those bulls can tell you if you're using a single reed, double reed, or triple reed. They call there. that a lot. Yeah, they do get called that a lot. So those are some of the the different calls. Now, we get asked this question a lot. Should I carry a cow call during rifle season? Absolutely. You got a bull walking away, going up a hill. Use it to hit that cow call to stop them. Um, Certain season are going on during the rut, some of the muzzleloader season. You can use it then. But for bow season, there's there's nothing better. Why don't we try with the grunt call? I mean – 
do it with and without just so that people can hear a little difference. You can just sound, it sounds so much more realistic with it. I agree 100%. All right, here we go. Here is without the grunt call. Do you want to do it with the grunt call? You got it. Okay. <laughs> this is with a grunt call. Now, I did a little longer than I would in a hunting scenario just because I was trying to get that sound where you could hear the difference. But let's do that grunt one more time with out the grunt call <laughs> and then with a grunt call. <clears throat> just gives it a, just a more natural sound. It's not so echoey. Instead, it sounds way better. Yeah, you get those guttural sounds out there. So why don't we go that we kind of went on the elk calling. There's going to be a lot of people that want to, I mean, a lot of people down south using these calls for turkey calling. Yep. It's com it's completely, I, I think these are way better because, I mean, you can be on your shotgun aiming at a turkey, and yep. if you need a call to lift his head, you don't have to take your box call, hit it, and then put it down, pull your shotgun up, and then shoot it. Right, absolutely. And and down south, there's a lot of states that have the fall turkey seasons, mm -hmm. and you can still call birds in. Now, to make that hen sound, why, what call are you making? What sounds? You're just going chuck, 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 or... Chuk, I mean, chuk, 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 or chuk, 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 or chip, 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 whatever you want to do. But that chuk, chuk, chuk is is one of the more common ones. Now this is with just a straight double read that I I use elk calling. I like the triple inverted V. I like that raspier sound you can get. One of the calls that you can do in the fall is called a kiki run, and those are younger turkeys, and, and they're gathering. They're trying to get gathered up in a flock, and they'll make this sound. And it's funny right now, Walker and Bree <laughs> raising some turkeys, and you hear that exact sound because they're, they're younger birds Every out there. morning you can hear them out there. It's very <laughs> lovely. <laughs> But but those are some sounds that that really will, will help people um, as as they're getting ready for for the fall turkey. Seasons. And what about like a? I mean, you can do a turkey alarm call. That always. I mean, that's kind of a last scenario. Lift your head, but yeah. you got one shot, and more than likely that's gonna run. So you're using those CVA Scout 410 shotguns. You got that bird in, and we always say you don't want to shoot them strutting. You want them to lift their heads up. And so the way that you can do that is you do a putt or a cluck sound, and that's just a. That's that alert sound. That bird will lift his head, and you get that stretched out. You got a way better target. So something else I was thinking about, too, is whenever you're calling, I know a lot of times if you've got a bull hanging up out there at 100 yards with your bow, Something we do a lot, too, is have the guy with the bow stay set up there, and then the caller will back off. Yes, absolutely. That That's buddy calling, and that is such a phenomenal tactic, is make that bull think that cow is leaving. Then he's wanting to come. Right, and that caller stays quiet. Now, it's really important to – Pick a good hunting buddy that can call. Not one that can't. <laughs> so that you're not doing all the calling and he's doing all the shooting or she's doing all the shooting. Make sure they're listening to this podcast, watching the video, they're practicing up. So also. if they don't know how to call, send them this podcast and say, here, be ready by September. Exactly. I'm you, it's a great plan. It, it is a great way to do it. Um, but but that's a great tactic. The other thing that I think is so important is talking about the wind, Wyatt. When, when you're out there calling – I am constantly checking the wind. Every two seconds. I know. I, I do. I use my wind checkers, and I'm constantly uh, – I've got my little uh, puffers, and I'm, I'm checking. And if the wind is wrong, don't force it, especially if you're hunting those elk in the same area. Say you're there for five, six days. You blow those elk out, they may go five miles away, and then it's over. And I know something we do a lot, too, is – 
the risk. Okay, so if it's the last day, maybe we'll try to be a little bit more risky on. Maybe we can slip in and get around and they won't get, like, try to get around just yeah. to push a little bit. But if, I mean, if it's middle of the season and we still have a week, there's days you'll just sit there and watch them from a thousand yards away and not yeah. even go close to them. It is. It's it's one of those things that I can't stress enough. So often people are like, I only have a week or I only have three days, and they're, they – they educate them. The other thing when you're talking, I'll come back to that, but make sure you always, always check that wind and you're not going to fool their noses and you're better they will off. They always smell you. They, they do. And I will tell you, sometimes people are like, oh, it's so windy. 15 to 20 mile an hour wind day. They can't hear as far, but you have that steady wind and you can move in and get in their back pockets and then call. I mean, and we've tried the scent spray and everything. No matter what, they will still smell something. Their noses can differentiate uh, your breathing, your breath. They can smell that, so that's uh, very, very important. The other thing, and we, we're doing this, I'll just tell you, we're doing this podcast later in the day. We've been going, guiding. Since 6 in the, the morning. morning. Since 6 in the morning, and it's later in the evening. So uh, one of the things I thought of is don't practice on elk. Practice in the car. Practice <laughs> Put in the your doors vehicle. shut and the windows up. Exactly. <laughs> no one around. I hear this so many times. Guys like, well, I didn't draw a tag, so I just went out and practiced during the season or before. Don't educate the elk. Don't they, screw it up for us. <laughs> yeah, they, it's it's one of those things that they become call shy. And I know people that drive down the logging roads on a four-wheeler or pickup, bugle, Drive a little farther, Buell, and bring those elk and, and, and spook them. So, so be careful. You know, something I'm excited about, too, this year is taking those uh, Rogue Ridge bikes that we just got, those electric-powered bikes. We can just cruise up a logging road. It's as quiet as can be. It doesn't put fumes out there for the elk to smell. Yep. And you can just coast right along. I mean, I think that's going to be really interesting. If you hear a bull bugle on and you're on private, you'll be able to slip around. I mean, if it's a lot of times we'll see an elk, he'll come out of the brush 30 minutes before dark. You can't get to it before right. dark. That might be, I think that's going to be something interesting. It is. Those bicycles, we've never tried it before. And uh, the folks over at Rogue Ridge, those things are, are amazing. They're tough. And we've been even uh, using them this summer, painting targets, just trying to see how, how they do. And the battery life is crazy. All I know is I need to learn how to ride a bike a little better. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't ridden one since I was a kid, and I, I might have crashed it a couple times, but that's okay. <laughs> well, that's because you're used to riding a horse all the time, and uh, <laughs> that bike's bucking you off a little bit. So, th we talked about calling a man. What about decoying? I know Ooh. that's something we do quite a bit. I mean, there's cow elk decoys, there's spikes, there's, I mean, Angus cow decoys. Yep. I mean, I mean, there's so many ways you can use decoys. What's your opinion on that? You know, I'll tell you, the Montana decoys, I've used them since they started back when Jerry McPherson started that company up in Colster, Montana. He gave me a sample to try, and wow, it was crazy. One of the things that I've learned, I love the decoys. Now, we talk about scent and having the wind right. One of the things I'll do with these decoys is I spray elk scent on them or elk urine, and I make it realistic. I've had elk come up and bulls lick the decoy the last time they ever did that, but they come in. They're thinking that is one skinny cow. <laughs> that is one skinny cow, that's for sure. Um, but you want to set them up where that elk can, can see it coming in, make it realistic, and uh, does it work every time? No, but does it work? A lot of times, absolutely. It's just like turkey decoys. It's the right one at the right time. It's It'll seal the deal. And you get a bull that might have hung up on you at 80 yards, and all of a sudden you get them at 30, 35 yards. And I think something a lot of people do that I've noticed, I've tried, and I know it doesn't work, is if you're calling in an elk, he is coming in, and he stops at 100 yards, and he's looking towards you, don't pull it out of your backpack and yeah, stick it yeah. up. Exactly. They're not that stupid, and uh, they didn't just walk by the bush and miss a cow elk standing there. I mean, yep, that they, is they know better than that. That is so true, and that brings up another really good point, Wyatt, because you've taken a lot of elk. I mean, you are still considered young. You're 20 years old, but you've been able to harvest elk in New Mexico, Montana, 
several Montana, several good bulls over the years. And you took your first elk with a bow when you were, what? 13. 13 years old. Walker and I were up in the Yukon, and we were, I was hunting moose up there, and you went out, and that was an amazing hunt. And part of that was you, you, you'd been around it, you grew up with it, but you practice, and you know when to draw, when not to draw. That's something I learned on my first, I mean, bow hunt. That's something I messed up on. I called, it was just a spike, but I still called him in to about eight yards. Yep. I mean, he was close. And I pulled my bow back, right? I mean, there was he was either going to walk over me or I was going to spook him with my bow. So I pull, I kind of risk it, and I knew as soon as I pull it back, I'm going to start cow calling. Yep. So as soon as I pull it back, I started cow calling. He just turned around, trotted out. 45 yards stopped and I hit him perfect <laughs> you did you made an awesome shot on video that was I tell you it was it's so incredible to be that age because I tell you the nerves will get to you and I tell people you can get away with a little bit more with an elk when when you're drawing or when you're there than with a whitetail so many people they get in whitetail mode mode and they don't want to draw well that bull if he's coming through time it but you get that draw and get the shot they don't jump the string they're a bigger target than the whitetail yeah they can jump it a little bit but you've got a bigger kill it's like, zone it's not like a whitetail that they can duck an arrow fast yeah especially those ones have been shot at a couple times yeah for sure but like that elk i shot he came in and i pulled back he knew that i was there stopped because he was just curious what the noise was and he didn't jump the string. I mean, at 40 yards, it took the arrow a second or two to get there. He, t I mean, he just stood there. And he was down in, what, about 30 seconds? 30 feet, probably. Yeah, he just whew, tipped right over. And and that is that is one of those things is practice. For example, this year, we are hunting wide open c country, and you can watch it on the, our show, Shoot Straight. It's going to be one of the ep episodes coming up. Was that bull right there? Oh, yeah, it was that bull right there. And... I was in wide open country, and though I'm a world champion elk caller, and I love to call, they were coming into a wallow in a water hole, and we set up, and I didn't call one time. You know how hard that is for me not to call? That's tough. But you got to know when to call, when not to call. The other thing is there was a bull coming in, and he's moving, and all of a sudden he jumped, and I thought, man, we're busted. He spooked, but he was looking past us to the left. I'm like, he's looking at another bull. And I drew back. I was kneeling down, and I had to draw back, sit up, and get the shot when that bull stepped out. And that's one of the things, not just practice your calling, but practice your shooting. And don't just sit at 20 yards, 30 yards, just sitting on flat ground. Shoot kneeling. Shoot at an angle. Try all these different things. Something Why that we do, too, is we'll put a target out and move it to a different spot and just have someone walk and say, okay, turn around and now shoot it and yep. without a range finder because i mean there's a lot of times when you call an elk in you don't have time to pull your range finder out and a little trick you taught is hey range a, a several trees and remember okay that tree's at 20 that one's at 30 that one's at 40 and yep. i mean that's a fast way to get a pretty close range it, it is so important and why i think you you hit on something that is so imperative and i've been talking about that in the seminars we're at the Great American Outdoor Sports Show up in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania last year, and, and Marsha and I got to do elk seminars. I love that venue. I love the diehard bow hunters up there. And the reason I talked about that is there are a lot of people that say, okay, I'm having a hard time at, at 30 yards, so I'm going to start at 40, and I'm just shooting 40 yards constantly. I'm going to shoot 50 yards constantly. Because you shoot those greater distances, all of a sudden your 20 and 30 yard shots, those groups tighten up. But if you consistently shoot the same distance all the time. If you go shoot 20, 30, 40, then you don't. I mean, what's your bow going to do at 35 yards? It might be a little bit different. It might be a little different. And the other thing is, if you're shooting the same distance all the time, say your backyard, you have 30 yards. And so you shoot 30 yards all the time, your muscle memory... The first thing you want to do is draw that bow back put and you put your 30 yard pin. And that animal may be at 20, it may be at 40. I was speaking in uh, Iowa this year and I had a whitetail hunter who said, You're exactly right. My wife went out, sat with me. It was the perfect night sitting in a ground blind. This buck came out and he was 
came in at 30 yards. I'd been practicing at 40 yards all season because I wanted to get better. He said I put my 40-yard pin on and shot right over top of his back. <laughs> That's just bad luck. <laughs> it is horrible, but there's a lot to be said for your muscle memory and your technique and, and practice that. So we were talking about the decoys. Something I think works really good, I mean, is the Angus cow decoys. Mm -hmm. I mean, even with antelope and mule deer, it's amazing how many cows, I mean, the elk I've seen literally are eating and watering it with the, with the cows every day. You know, why? last night your mom and I went out glassing and we're sitting there right before dark and I know the elk are in this area and I'm not seeing them and there was a, two or three different groups of Angus cattle up there and there was some mixed some Herefords in there little red cows and I'm looking I'm like wait a minute and there was a five-point bull within five yards of a half dozen cattle and he was just feeding with them you gotta think those cows are wanting the best grass and the elk want the best grass so i mean why wouldn't they be in the same i have trail camera pictures of a cow drinking out of a water tank with an elk drinking out of the same water tank at the same time oh wow is I mean, that on your reveal ones yep that, that's mean, crazy they're out there and they're in the same spot so i mean those decoys something to do too is i know a lot of times if we're hunting between two patches of trees or in the open you can take those decoys and a lot of times just walk right across the open behind them and yep. they don't think anything about it. That's that's exactly right. That's a super good good tip, Wyatt, that just to carry that with you and have it have it in your backpack. Except in the wind. <laughs> yeah, in the wind that it, it flutters. Those are like kites and cows don't go five feet in the air, so <laughs> <laughs> that might spin you up. Oh a bit. my word, for sure. So elk season's coming up. You start practicing these calls. What are you doing to scout right now? What are you looking for? You know, I've got all my trail cams out right now. And in Montana, you can have them text you not in season. So right. pretty soon when it's September comes around, I'll have to turn those and take the antennas off where they can't text me. But right now, I like to leave the trail cams out and not go bug where the elk are. I mean, so I've got them, and they'll send me a message. I'll, I'm getting every night, I'm probably getting about 150, 200 pictures elk. Wow. I mean, just going crazy, the amount of pictures, white tails. So I'm kind of just seeing where they're bedding, where they're transitioning, where they're watering. So right now I know where they're watering every day. So hopefully, so come September when the rut, before the rut even starts, hopefully those elk are going to be hitting the same water holes that they are hitting right now before they try to go find cows. And hopefully I'll be able to intersect one and get one. I tell you, there's, there's a lot of great technology you can use, and, and having that, um, it just allows you to stay out of the areas, like you said, and give them their space. You don't want to put your scent all over it. And uh, we, the, the other thing we do is reveal with the, with the tactic cam, they have a, a camera that goes right on your spot and scope. So you can sit there and, and video uh, those elk from a distance, and that's the key. Give them their bedding areas, and you're going to have more success. Some of those people just go traipsing through the woods. Oh, let's go find where the elk are bedding. Well, you go blow them out of there. They might be in the next county when you have time to go hunt them. That's right. Have good optics, glass from a distance, and uh, then get in there close before you start calling. And I think something that you've taught me, too, is don't disrupt their bedding area. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that hard to back off and try to – get them in a transition or at water or at when they're going out to eat at night or something different then if you go blowing through their bedding area that's their little safe haven it, it is and one of the things that we have done a lot over the years is we'll go and be in our area we're going to hunt at first light if we can get on a bowl that's great if not we're watching where they're going to go bed pockets of timber they're going into and then get the wind right and try and catch them late afternoon, early evening when they get up. And you're, you're at such a higher advantage. And I know something we do a lot is we'll go sit in the mornings, watch where they go in in bed. 99% of the time, they're going to come out the same way they went in. Yep. So yep. that's a, I mean, that's a great way. And sometimes I know that's in places where you can spot and stalk. But you're, if you go hunt up in the thick timber, you might not see an elk for three days but you might come within 30 yards of one right and and one of the other things to do is know that 
lot of these bulls and cows are going to bed on the north facing slopes those are your slopes that have more timber and it's thicker and they they have their escape routes in there so when you're looking at areas on your maps uh, you're using onyx or whatever you're using um make sure you look at at those timber areas and then find water they especially sometimes that early september it can be still 80 degrees in places you're hunting they have to drink and i know even today i took prairie dog hunters out and the creek that normally runs through this draw is dry now so i went and we were shooting these prairie dogs and there's this one watering hole where the antelope blind is and by the time i drove up into this draw I spooked five antelope going in, and then we shot this prairie dog down. I mean, we shot for an hour. Mm -hmm. Constant shooting came out, and there was about 15 antelope drinking out of on the way out. Yep. They, they got to have water. I mean, that is that is one thing. I was over in Mozambique, Africa with good buddy Wayne Wagner, who's an amazing professional hunter in Mozambique, and they did a lot of water development over there. And one of the things that he said that I, I thought was so awesome is he said, Chad, where there's water, there's life. Where there's no water, there's no life. And I thought how important that, what a great analogy that is in our life also, is water plays such an important thing, and it, it's it's just such an amazing part of, of being out there in the woods. And that's something that I enjoy too, is taking a backhoe, developing ponds and water. And I think the difference, sometimes if you can just make a bigger body of water, and like I put one where all trails come together, mm -hmm. it's kind of... And I clean trails so they can come, oh, maybe they're walking down this fence line and there's a wide open trail to the pond. Then they're going to find that pond and that's something they might pick up on and drink more often. Oh, absolutely. There is no question. Anytime you can develop habitat, and, and, and that's something that I love uh, being a part of the Mule Deer Foundation and uh, being on their board of directors is the different habitat projects and things that are done for wildlife and, and the guzzlers they do a lot of times down in Arizona and places like that, they, they'll put those guzzlers out there and that really increases the number of wildlife in an area. And it's amazing to see the animals that like clean, cold water. Yeah. I mean, if you go and have, I, I've seen several ponds where the cows are in it and they're just like water walking out in it, making it muddy and silty and dirty. There's way more chance they're gonna, they, I see elk, they'll walk another a half mile just to get to a tank where it's feeding in at where the elk, i mean where the cows can't get to just so they can have clean water they like that clean water you see that with your horses too they no like different the, that clean water it's no different than than anything i mean they'll drink it if they have to but if they have a choice they're going to go for that that clean water absolutely and i um something i think we should hit on is where how close are you getting elk before you start calling at them great question and the biggest thing, like we've said, and we're going to say it again, is watch the wind, get in there. I like to get 400 yards or less. And if I can get 200 yards or if less. you can get 100 yards, you would, wouldn't you? It's I would. And the thing that you got to be careful with are satellite bulls and perimeter elk, what I call it, where you've got that herd bull up there. But there could be some satellite bulls, which are smaller bulls, and sometimes there's some big satellite bulls that are hanging around the biggest bull. I know that messed us up one time. We were going after the big herd bull, and then, but we weren't. We were trying to call it the herd bull, and then a raghorn comes in and blows him out because he was he was closer, and he thought he could sweep in and get a cow that was ready for him. That's exactly right, and and you got to be be aware of that. And sometimes those, like you said, some of those satellites can be good. But you got to watch it. So if you've got a lot of those perimeter elk out there, you've got to be careful as you're making your move on it that you don't bust them and, and cows and calves and, and, and everything else. Absolutely. And other deer. Uh, that's blowing a lot of elk out too. Is You'll be walking down a draw and here comes a white-tailed doe snorting at you. And that's never a good noise to hear. No, it, it's it's not. And you've got to – those elk pay attention. I've even hunted areas where the wild turkeys were in there, and those turkeys, you spook them, they start clucking. Those elk are like, whoa, what's, what's going on? And I think a lot of first-time elk hunters is be careful for what else you might call in. What do you mean, why? I mean, there's a there's not just elk out there. There's mountain lions, and there there are bears. So. There are bears. Uh, that's something like our good buddy was here last year, who was on the podcast, Mr. Dudley, 
and he was walking up and came over a hill and he looked over and there's a mountain lion 85 yards from him just walking up the same trail he was yep you, you got to do that and if you're cow calling know that they're you're not the only thing that's out there hunting and also some of these places where all the grizzlies are they hear <laughs> if you're out rifle hunting they hear a gunshot and that is a dinner bell for them you know that that's something going on in montana right now and and uh, a lot of my guide buddies they'll sit there and they make sure the hunters are standing watch while they're where they're dressing those elk because you got to be careful some you don't uh, want to mess with 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 some of those things and and in the last couple of years in Montana, we've had bear attacks by guys out there elk hunting. And so um, be, be aware. Be, Absolutely. Be aware. Well, I think that was a great episode. Episode five of Beyond the Big Sky, talking about elk calling, how to get started. We covered a lot of stuff on pretty much elk hunting 101. So Absolutely. Wyatt, let's do this. Let's close out this podcast. And we want you to sit there i was gonna say close your eyes but some of you are driving right now don't close your eyes yeah don't close your eyes we don't want to be liable for a car accident <laughs> again don't close your eyes <laughs> eyes open turn your speakers up if you're out, up at home it'll drive all your dogs crazy you might have but we're gonna sound like a herd of elk peak rut and uh it always makes the hair on my arm stand up when we do this that doesn't make you excited for september i don't know what will (laughs) good luck this season everybody thanks for watching